May I now kindly request Mr. Yadav to address the audience on today's topic, which is Citizenship Amendment Act and the Indian Constitution. Thank you. Delighted and amazed. Delighted that I have an opportunity to speak to all of you. Amazed that you could organize it on a Sunday. I don't know of many campuses in the country where students would turn up on a Sunday evening to listen to a lecture on something to do with the Constitution. So you must be doing something right in this institution to get the students enthused to do that. Uh, thank you very much. I'm really delighted. When your friend started reading my bio, which is clearly picked up from some Wikipedia, <laughs> I was dreading it. I said, here it comes. Because all this is about a life that I don't lead anymore. I have forgotten all that. Uh, I am an ex-academic, a lapsed psychologist, and a failed politician. <laughs> that would be a correct description of who I am. So, uh, you could, with that correct description, you could listen to what I have to say. I wanted to speak to you about the Citizenship Amendment Act, which is uh, a raging controversy in the country, which is how it should be. I know it relates to NRCC and uh, NPR as well. For the time being, allow me to keep that out because that raises altogether different kinds of questions. And as students of law and constitution, I wanted to focus with you on CAA itself. That's just to delimit. But in the course of question answers, I would be very happy to take questions on NRC, or N NR, NPR, etc. You know, the whole gamut of it, or anything under the sun. So we can have that in Q&A. Uh, but let me, <clears throat> in the course of what I have to say, let me confine myself to CAA itself. Let me begin by stating a position. And then, in the course of my lecture, I would hopefully defend it. The position is rather strong, and therefore it needs very strong reasoning. I believe CAA is perhaps the biggest assault on Indian constitution that we have ever witnessed in the last 70 years. I really want to convince you. I don't want to speak to your emotions at all. I have strong emotions attached to it, but I'll keep the emotions out. I really want to convince you. And in the Q&A, anyone who disagrees with me will get first choice, first option to ask me, interrogate me. So, please do not, I mean, I would invite you all to start with suspicion. I'll state my position. Please begin by disagreeing with me. At least assuming that what I'm saying may be wrong. And then I'll try and argue for it. So my position is that CAA is the biggest assault on Indian constitution that we have witnessed in the last 70 years. This act is unconstitutional, is wrong, unjust, unconstitutional, so much so that any right-thinking citizen must resist it. Not merely is it wrong, not merely such a law should not be passed, but that is incumbent upon us to actually oppose it on the street. Now that's a very strong claim. You can occasionally disagree with laws. Parliaments being parliaments pass all kinds of laws, good, bad, indifferent. But not every law that you don't like, you say go and resist it. It's only in the rarest of rare cases should we ever say resist this law not just oppose it, not just dislike it. It's our duty to resist it. So the onus is on me to come up with some really strong arguments to say what I'm saying. 
otherwise to simply say well the, uh, the law is not good is not good enough okay so the burden of proof is on me all right <clears throat> any piece of law is a response to a real life situation is a response to a need in the light of some principles which are then given a legal formulation so i'll first speak about the need then i'll speak about the principles then i'll come to the exact legal formulation to say why i think this is the most obnoxious piece of law passed by the parliament the need just imagine if i had come to your university 6 months ago and if i had asked all of you to list the 10 main problems of india that need resolution suppose all of you had to list 10 problems just just run in your own mind the list of those 10 problems that you would have i'm sure many of us would list education health someone would say climate change someone could say poverty you feel particularly strong about uh, environment you can have something else added to that list you know you can all have so we can have say several hundred lists being prepared in this room i want to know how many of you would have said citizenship is a problem in india one yeah sure sure one how many of you would have said in your initial list 6 months ago not today 6 months ago if i came and said list the 10 most important problems in this country which need an immediate resolution how many of us would have said citizenship would, would figure on that list one you said you know good good to be dissented 1 2 3 4 5 maybe maybe let's say 10 yeah. what does that tell us um i don't know where you come from but if i was from the northeast i would have probably listed citizenship as one of the problems because it is an issue in that part of the country for most other parts of the country it's a non issue it's a non existing problem I don't mean to say there was no problem at all. You know, there is a problem. There is a very minor problem in some parts of the most parts of the country, and there is a slightly major problem in one part of the country. The minor problem is that when uh, people came from Pakistan to India, or uh, people came Tamils came from the, uh, Sri Lanka to India, the provisions for inducting them were not. very not very lucid these are very complicated procedures <coughs> so when hindus or sikhs or christians who are indeed being persecuted there is absolutely no doubt about the question that minorities have been persecuted in pakistan were very severely persecuted in east pakistan as well and even after the formation of bangladesh often on there has been persecution of minorities so there was a limited problem of people coming from pakistan coming from sri lanka uh coming from tibet we didn't have very good laws although the laws permitted and this has been happening you all of would know that our laws did permit the government to offer citizenship to anyone who came from pakistan wherever in the world and it could be offered it was indeed being offered but the procedures were somewhat bureaucratic that's a minor problem the major problem was in area surrounding bangladesh the borders were porous massive migration took place unchecked unregulated migration took place especially in the 60s 70s almost till 80s it took place and that led to huge resentment in assam how many of you are from assam 1 2 3 not too many um i really think for all of you a uh, small suggestion on the way um everyone should spend 3 4 months in the northeast if we want to get a sense of india and what india is must spend a few months in the northeast to just get a sense of what this country really is so in assam it was an issue 
it was a major problem in some parts of Assam and some districts bordering Bangladesh in West Bengal. So, my first point is, was there a need? Well, there was a modest, moderate kind of a need. Was it a pressing need? Not really. Could it have been done a few years later? Of course, yes. It's been happening for, if it wasn't handled for the last 30 years. You could do it three years later, four years later. Is there, should it be among the top agenda of this country when the country faces economic slowdown, when we have unemployment at its peak, when we have inflation which is going up, when we have rural distress, in the midst of all this, is citizenship the topmost problem that this country should be addressing at the cost of everything else? I hope most of you would agree with me that this is probably not the topmost priority. You know, you could say, of course, why can't we do both? Why can't we handle inflation and handle citizenship? Of course you can, provided the method of handling citizenship is not such that it disrupts everything else in the country. I would hope to argue later that CAA is to our society what demonetization was to our economy. A completely avoidable, needless disruption of the entire society and economy. That's about need. Okay, let's say all right, even if the need is modest, kar diya to kya bura hai? Problem thi na, there was a problem, it's been, it's been responding to. All right, so how should we respond to the problem? Citizenship was, and I've said citizenship was a moderate problem, moderate to intense problem, which could have been handled, should be handled at some point. All right, Mr. Modi decides 2019 is the right year to handle it. What should be the principle in the light of which we handle it? Because F law in the last instance is a way of inscribing and giving a legal language to a moral principle. The principle comes first. To my mind, the best enunciation of that principle was done by someone that might surprise you. This is Swami Vivekananda. Swami Vivekananda speaking in Chicago in 1893 enunciates a principle, which I think is such a beautiful principle. It's sort of, it's a civilizational principle, as it were. He says, I'm proud of being an Indian. He also says, I'm proud of being Hindu. And he gives reasons. I don't want to get distracted into that, but that's a beautiful reason for why he says he's proud. And he basically says, I'm proud of being a Hindu because my religion accepts the truth of every other religion. It's such a beautiful way of understanding Hinduism, but I'll not get distracted into that. He says, I'm proud of being an Indian. I'm proud of being an Indian because this land has offered shelter to anyone who asked for refuge, no matter what his nationality is, no matter what his religion is. Now, in a sense, if I had produced this quote, you would say, no, 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 you're cheating. You are, you are, in, you are inserting this quote into Vivekananda's mouth after CAA. It almost looks like Vivekananda responding to CAA. He's saying, he's saying, offer shelter, that a great country and a great civilization must open its heart and door to anyone who seeks shelter without asking for nationality or religion. These are his words. Just check it up. In Google, you can check it in one minute. These are exactly his words. He uses the word nationality and religion as things which must not be the criteria. I find it a beautiful principle because as a, as a large country, as a civilization, we are not just a nation, we are a civilization. As a civilization, as geographically a large entity, as one of the few sustained democracies in the region, it should be our duty, it would be it would feel, make me feel good as an Indian if I could say, we open our heart and door to anyone from outside. Now, obviously, you cannot open it to everyone. Not anyone can walk in wherever you want. So you would say, okay, anyone who is persecuted, anyone who really needs, 
anyone in my neighborhood to begin with, but ideally I would say anyone from any part of the world. Anyone who feels persecuted in North Korea, anyone who feels persecuted in Syria, they should be, you know, you prove that you have been persecuted, of course, you can't just walk in. You have to give some evidence, some, something to a reasonable claim that you need shelter, not just that you want it, that you need it. That to me is the best principle. India should be open to anyone who needs shelter. I would add a secondary principle that Vivekananda does not mention, but he may not have been aware of, or he, you know, I mean, from his purpose that was not necessary. But 100 years later, I would add a small secondary principle. Provided the burden is equally shared by the entire country. You cannot say, let's have immigration, let's invite everyone, and all of them should settle in New Raipur. I understand New Raipur has a lot of spaces vacant right now, and can take a lot of population, including refugees. Uh, but there would be a limit to which you can take it. So you can't say that all the burden has to be put on three districts of Assam or four districts of Bengal. If as a country you think you want to be open to refugees, then it has to be shared, shared responsibility of the entire country. So does that sound like a fair principle? I would suggest that, that let that be the principle open to anyone who is persecuted in the world on any ground. It could be sexual preference, it could be religion, it could be language, it could be race. You can be persecuted for hundreds of reasons. If you are persecuted, come in, but we'll share the burden across the country. All right? All right. Now let's turn to the third part, namely examining the exact provisions of the law. Does the law respond to that need? Does the law conform to these principles? Fair enough. Okay. Now the good news is, you know, so when you watch television discussions, what do the uh, proponents of CAA say? They say, look, it's such a reasonable piece of law. What are we doing? They almost speak in Swami Vivekananda's language. They say, look, there are persecuted minorities from our neighborhood. We are providing them space. What's wrong with that? We are not taking anyone's citizenship away. What's wrong with this piece of law? Sounds utterly reasonable. Sounds decent. Sounds humane. You may get slightly suspicious. Why is the BJP suddenly so concerned about minorities? I mean, it's, there's something odd, isn't it? BJP suddenly so, the bill ekdam pasiriya jisko kehte ekdam liquefaction of your heart as they say in Indian English. You know, about minorities? But chalo, be kar diya, chai kiya hoga. Now the interesting thing is, none of these expressions figure in the law. Your students of law, please check the text of the law. Preamble, take the preamble out. Because finally, the law will be examined on its provisions. <coughs> Neighboring country, no sir, such an expression does not exist in the law. In the CAA, in its provisions, it does not mention the word neighboring country. Persecuted, persecution, <laughs> religious persecution, no, the word does not figure in law. CAA does not mention the word religious persecution. <coughs> Minorities, no. It does not mention the word minorities. Refuge or refugees? No, it does not mention the word. So all the four things being said in support of CAA are red headings. They actually don't exist in the law. If there was such a law which said, okay, I mean, as I said, if the law simply said, we would grant refuse to anyone from our neighboring country who suffers from minorities who suffer from religious persecution. I would have said, all right, I'll go with this law. Although it's a little citizens, of course you can. Is it reasonable classification? 
I hope to persuade you that on five grounds, this is unreasonable. Not one, not two, five grounds, five substantial grounds. One, why pick up three countries? Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh. Afghanistan is not even our neighbor. Only technically it is. Technically on the map of India, you can see Afghanistan's boundary touching India. But as you know, that's part of Pakistan occupied Kashmir and no one from Afghanistan can walk into India. That's not possible. But Afghanistan. Why these three? Why not Sri Lanka? Why not Nepal? Why not Bhutan? Why not Myanmar? What could possibly be the justification? The official justification is because these three are theocratic countries. All right. So those who want Hindu Rashtra are very worried about theocratic country. Lovely. But what about Sri Lanka? Sri Lankan constitution article 9 clearly says promoting Buddhism is part of Sri Lanka's, is part of constitutional principles of Sri Lanka. So why not Sri Lanka? He said, no, 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 but religious minorities have constitutional rights. I think these people don't study constitutions. Bangladesh religious minorities have rights. Pakistan religious minorities have rights. Every, every country that oppresses its minorities have on statute some bit of rights written for them. So to my mind, there is absolutely no reason. And then of course, I forgot to mention China. Why not these countries? So no basis for this classification. Second is only uh, religious persecution. Why religious persecution? Why not ethnic persecution? Why not linguistic persecution? Why not regional persecution? What's happening to Tibetans in Sri Lanka and in China? That's persecution, persecution of the worst order being perpetuated there. Why not that? What's happening to Madhesis in Nepal? It is not the worst form, but it is persecution and discrimination taking place against them. Why not entertain that? And what about Tamils in Sri Lanka? That's clearly ethnic discrimination, persecution taking place. Why not uh, allow that? So why only religious persecution? To my mind, there is no coherent answer. Third, attached to that, only to religious minorities. Now, why only, only to minorities? And why only to these six specified minorities? Incidentally, all these countries have minorities other than these six. Bangladesh has 40 minorities. Enemies, atheists, there are all kinds of small minorities there. Why only these six? Why not others? And why only, why not Ahmadiyas who have been persecuted on ground? They are a sect. They are not officially a minority. They are Muslims. But they are persecuted on a religious basis. So third, again, I see absolutely no basis for that classification. There are two more, two more things in the law. One is up to 2020, 2014, December 2014. Now remember all those lovely things about Pakistani cricketer who's being unfairly treated, Dinesh Kanelia, he was being unfairly treated. Now under the law, he will be able to get protection. No sir, he will get no protection unless he came before 2014. Only those who came before 2014 will get this. Why? What happened in 2014? <laughs> Unless you want to, you know, the BCAC, the world was in 2014, the world was in 2014. What happened in 2014? Why? And the fifth is the law shall not apply to inner line states. States where there is inner line permit. Inner line permit is almost a visa like arrangement within the country, which was originally for Nagaland, Mizoram, parts of Anunachal Pradesh, and has recently been extended to Manipur. 
Now tell me, for this particular reason, inner line permit has to do with security of the country, has to do with other things. But what on earth justifies that people who live in, let us say, Nagaland, let us say Manipur, the hills of Manipur, and who happen to be migrants who have come in, etc. If I am a Hindu Bengali living in Manipur, why should I not have the benefit of this law? While the same Hindu Bengali who went to Tripura will get the benefit of this law. Why? No reason. The only simple explanation is, this is a political setting. Setting is a beautiful word which is used only in Hindi. Because setting ho gaya Setting here because these states were out, these states, there was enormous resistance to CAA in these states. Mr. Amit Shah makes a phone call, says, Tumme bahar rakhtenge, tum chinta mat karo, don't protest. That's all. So five kinds of unfairness built into the law. Is that the only reason why I oppose it? No, that's not all. Above all, I oppose it, not only for this discrimination, not only for this divisiveness. It is the first time in the history of this country, and you would all be able to tell me if I'm wrong, that Indian citizenship is being linked to religion. Never was Indian citizenship linked to religion in any form. 2015, they had started the process in some rules, so of course that's part of the CA arrangements. But Indian citizenship was not linked to religion. And that's not a small accident. There was a massive debate in this country. The country was partitioned. And what was the debate during Indian freedom struggle? What was Mr. Jinnah's argument? Mr. Jinnah's argument, following a straight European understanding of nation state, Mr. Jinnah was very truly European investor. He said, Two different religions means two different countries because nationality flows from your religion, flows from your ethnicity. Hindus and Muslims are two different nations. What did our mainstream of our freedom struggle say? No, sir. In India, those principles shall not work. Nehru, Gandhi, Patel, Azad, whatever the other differences, on this one question, they were all aligned. They said, we shall not allow this principle of two-nation theory. That was the whole point. India's birth is rooted in opposition to two-nation theory. You can have an Islamic state in Muslim-majority countries. Pakistan could be a state primarily for Muslims, but India is not a state for any one religion. That is the founding moment of this country. Sorry, I seem to have touched some emotions, which I had pledged not to. You know, I must confess, there are very deep emotions that run. But I today promised myself that I will not touch on any emotions. I just did the argument. This is the very founding moment of this country. That this country is not based on religion. We are not Israel. Israel says, no matter which part of the world you live in, if you are a Jew, you have a claim to come to Israel and claim your citizenship. Practically, that is being advocated by CAA. If you are Hindus, don't worry, apnei logo, papers nahi hai, koi ki farak pehenda hai, aajau, aajau. That's basically what it says. You don't have papers, it doesn't matter. You are Hindus, na apnei logo, aajau, ghar aajau. Muslims, no, thank you, sorry, out. That's basically, so the law basically amounts to, I mean, you could actually, some of these laws, you don't need to have such long legal summaries. There's a three-word summary of the CAA as a law. No Muslims, please. This is a board. It's a sign board outside India that says, no Muslims, please. That is the essence of this law. Why has this law been actually brought in? If all these things don't work out, if the ostensible reasons given for the law are not true? To my mind, the reasons are either petty or obnoxious. The petty reasons are desire to win Assam elections, Assam and Bengal elections. In Assam, as you know, NRC took place. Uh, NRC was not introduced by BJP. 
NRC was brought in by the Supreme Court. The BJP was under a happy impression that after all that filtering and so on, mostly Bengali Muslims will be caught. But finally, at the end of it, it had more Hindus than Muslims. And BJP, for those of you who are not familiar with Assam's politics, like Samajwadi Party is considered the party of Yadavs and Muslims. Similarly, in Assam, BJP is considered the party of Bengali Hindus. It is not primarily a party of Ahomiya Hindus. It's Bengali Hindus who are the core vote bank of BJP in Assam. And 13 lakh people from that core vote bank were caught in NRC, declared foreigners. So this is, at its minimum, it's an attempt to save BJP's vote bank. One step further, it's an attempt to win West Bengal elections. Because in Bengal, there is no way the BJP can win election unless it becomes extremely communal Hindu versus Muslim election. Bengal has a history of very deep communal violence, which we have forgotten in the last 30, 40 years. Bengal was one of the most communally disturbed areas of the country. BJP wants to stoke that fire once again. And this is a perfect instrument to stoke that fire. That's bad. It's sinister. So it's either petty or sinister or obnoxious. The obnoxious reasoning is that you basically, and that is the final thing that I wish to say, basically this law is about introducing two categories of citizenship. Honestly, this law is not about giving anyone citizenship except You know, we are fortunate. When there was freedom struggle in this country, we were not born. When this country fought against emergency, most of you were not born. I was around, but I was too young to do anything. I was 13 year old, 14 year old. I could watch, I have clear, vivid memories of what was being done, what, was, what happened to my father and everything. But I couldn't have done anything about it. And I always felt, yeah, those were great times. Could we don't do anything, you know. It's just as it so happened that history cheated us. We were not there. Aren't we lucky that we are around and alive today? That when something like this is being done, we can oppose it. That, to me, is not just our right. I think that is our duty as citizens of this country. If at all we are proud of being an Indian, we should be ashamed of this law. No pride ever comes without shame. If you can never be shamed about something, you don't love that thing. If you think your house is your home is great, you bring your friends in and your home is utterly messy that particular day, you do feel bad, kya kya. Unless you cringe, you don't love your home. You know, if you think, Jo hota hai, mein sab hai. That's not, this is a football club loyalty. This is not, this is not deep sense of pride. If you take pride in India, as I do, you must have sense of shame about some things that happen in this country. And this is one of those moments when every citizen must resist. 20 years later, 30 years later, people like me won't be around. But you would be. And someone would ask you, what exactly were, we, were you doing in 2020? Make sure you have an answer. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we'll open the house for questions. I uh, request your questions to be. Uh, regulated according to the uh, discussion happened today and uh, yeah and anyone who disagrees gets first chance exactly dissent gets priority <laughs> जो क्वेश्चन पूछेगा ना उसके ऊपर पैन करना है और ज़ूम हटा ज़ूम कर अभी नहीं अभी नहीं इसके पास है गुड इवनिंग टू यू सर माय नेम इज हरि जय कुमार एंड आई एम इन माय फाइनल सेमेस्टर हियर सर Thank you for your speech, first of all. But I think that I found your speech intentionally divisive 
and trying to scare and rouse our emotions in an unjustified manner. And the reason for that is as follows. I believe that, sir, your classification that you're talking about, five, reason, five classifications that you think come under the ambit of reasonable classification, I think that were largely based on what you perceive to be moral and what you perceive based on where you stand politically. And I don't think that those are the considerations that are there in the ambit of reasonable classification when we look at it from a legal perspective. For example, in the cases of Indra Sani, the great reservation case, even then the same debate arose as to what constitutes reasonable classification and there the court took legal grounds essentially, even then the uh, concept of caste and class, all of these controversies came up, who is going to be the greater, sort of have the greater status in society, who is other backward class is going to take over, upper caste or is upper caste not going to have a voice, same similar sort of questions happened. But the court took a reason, in their judgment took a reason stance and said that reasonable classification is going to be based on these, these, these factors, even though ostensibly on the face of it, they may seem divisive, they're really not. And I think that even in this case, the proposition can be made that reasonable classification that you are taking is based on what you consider to be moral and not what the law actually says is reasonable classification. So why don't you make that case? Because, you see, you have, you have said two things. One, you have, uh, one, you have uh, read my intentions about which I cannot uh, possibly say anything. Uh, second, you have said in principle it can be defended. Uh, in principle, any division, can, any distinctions can be defended. Please tell me of the five, which one do you disagree and why? That would make an argument. Otherwise, I can say you are reading, you know, how can we read each other's intentions unless you have a special access to my heart? <laughs> so, I have, I have noted all five of your points and I consent with all five of them. And I will tell you why. Firstly, when we are talking about three countries, sir, Afghanistan, um, so that everyone can have a chance to ask questions. Any one that you find strongest objection, just list that. Okay. The strongest objection that I found was the fifth one when you talk about inner line permit states won't apply and you say that that's because of political considerations. However, sir, the test of reasonable classifications as judges are going to look at it are not going to look at it in the consideration as to whether this is a political point or not. They are going to look at it in terms of what the law says and how that law ought to be interpreted. And because there are so many media trials and so many people saying so many things and a lot of armchair activists and things like that are saying so many things, we are not going to consider as to what these people are saying or what their morality or what their stances can be, but rather what the law is saying and how that law ought to be interpreted in terms of our duty as a judge. So the last thing that political considerations matter, but they don't really in terms of the law. Now, just answer this, or anyone can answer this. I am an, I'm a migrant who crossed over from Bangladesh into India. One of, uh, so we are five, four brothers, maybe two brothers, two sisters. We enter from Bangladesh into India. We don't have papers, like millions of people who came from Bangladesh to India. One of the brothers settles in Tripura. The second goes to Meghalaya. These are very close by. The third travels a little more, crosses over to Mizoram. The fourth travels a little more and enters Now, according to the current law, the first two will be given Indian citizenship. The second and third will not be. The second will not be given. The third will not be given citizenship. Fourth could have been given a citizenship till two months ago, but now it won't be. Because Mizoram Manipur has just been brought under inner line permit. It was not. Now, give me a reason for that. This is reasonable classification. Anyone, not him. I just, just don't put burden on that. Of course, the court will not go by my reading of what were the true motives of Modi government. Of course, who can get into anyone's heart? But the court must ask, okay, why is it, on what ground do we distinguish between these four hypothetical brothers? Just because one happens to go to Tripura, another happens to go, all of them have, don't have papers, all of them are Hindus, all of them, let us say, were persecuted in Bangladesh. Depending on how many kilometers you traveled, you would be distinguished. Can anyone give me an answer? 
That's a question. Good evening, sir. Uh, so, with all due respect, I have a small doubt here. So, isn't all of this about balancing the national interests and the international human rights standards? When I talk about national interests, by interests I mean natural resources, employment opportunities, etc. So, sir, I totally understand that this act specifically excludes only one community of people. But, sir, isn't it about balancing the national interests with that of the international human rights standards? So, secondly, I have one more doubt. Um, so, don't you think everything related to this act has only and merely become a political propaganda which all the parties today are trying to with respect to which they're trying to, you know, humiliate and put forward their own ideologies or, say, promote their party as a whole. So, so what do you have to say about these two things? Thank you. On the second, I would uh, suggest and very strongly urge uh, that uh, politics should be welcomed. Uh, as long as an important question, in fact, you should be worried <laughs> if an important and weighty question of our times does not become political. Women's security, gender discrimination, if it becomes, I mean, as, no, as, as of now, it has not become a political question, really, in the country, in the sense that no government ever fears losing elections on that question. The day gender equality becomes a political question in this country, overnight things will change in this country. We should want things to we should be worried if big things do not become political. Remember, democracy runs on politics. So I hope, at least in this campus, we would not be worried of things becoming political. We should be worried about things becoming non-political. Hunger becomes an issue if it is political. Uh, and that's the argument of Amartya Sen. Amartya Sen's argument about famine is exactly this. Because in China, you don't have politics. People died of Famine. India had politics, therefore people survived. So we should welcome politics rather than. So I mean, there, there's this very lazy thing which goes on. Are politics aga iske andar to etc. I mean, that's a very lazy argument. In democracy, we should welcome politics rather than resist it. The second question that you had was about balancing uh, human rights considerations and national interest. Of course, we have to balance, and I myself said that. Uh, you know, as some people, in, when I quoted Vivekanand, some of the BJP trolls said, Tom kya dharamshala bana de, kya desh ko? But if you remember, I had said, no, it should not be open to anyone and everyone to walk in. Hmm? We should care, you know, if someone comes from North Korea, you should ask him, are you really persecuted? Is India the only country you could come to? If so, yes, you are in, otherwise not. If Rohingyas come to India, Ask them questions, you know, is, is this category really deserving of support? Have they really seriously faced persecution? So, of course, it should not be an open dharamshala. Balancing, of course, has to be done. Balancing about the quantum you can take. We are not Australia or Canada. We have limited numbers that we can take. And of course, we have to be selective. But selective does not mean discriminatory. You know, that's the whole point. My opposition is not that you take only a few and you leave out many. This we will have to do. We are not a country which, is, which has dearth of population. So we have to be selective. Selectiveness to become discriminatory is the problem. Now, unless you believe, and I really hope you don't mean so, that our national interest is in preventing Muslims. That you don't mean. Sure. So, I, so we completely agree. Yeah. So, as I said, we have to do two things to balance this. Number one, we have to put stringent conditions about, you know, show me that you are persecuted. Don't walk in just like this. And two, if you come in, you can't choose where you want to settle. I can probably send you to Chhattisgarh. And this is exactly what happened after 1971. Lots of uh, migrants came in from Bangladesh, and many of them were actually sent to Chhattisgarh to settle. So you have to balance it that way as well. I completely agree on both these things. What is the problem with the law is that in the name of balancing, 
it is utterly, utterly discriminatory and discriminatory on the one ground that it should not be. That's the problem. Uh, hi sir. So, uh, what's your take on the sense that is prevailing about the Indian judiciary after the Ram Pandir judgment, specifically about the petitions, uh, specifically, specifically about the way judiciary is handling CEA petitions? Uh, Okay, I'll answer this, but I'll, as I said, I promised my dissenters first choice, so we've had two. If there is any other dissenter, they should get priority. Uh, my reading of the Supreme Court judgment on Ram Janakovi is the following. One thousand pages of lovely English, and at the end of it, Mandir Vahi <laughs> As I said, I was speaking to some of your friends informally before the meeting, and I reminded them of ADM Jawadur, the most infamous case in the history of Indian judiciary, when Supreme Court of India said, you don't have right to life, someone can shoot you, and that's actually the argument that took place in the court. The court said, so are you telling us that you, if you shoot someone, that person's, uh, the person has no right? And the Advocate General had said, yes, sir, that's exactly what I'm saying. And that is what the judgment said. Now, the interesting thing about ADM Jabalpur case was that the bench that decided the case had three of the most luminary judges of our country. We forget that. We should remember these things. Justice Baig, Justice Chandrachur, the senior Chandrachur, who was known to be a very good judge, and Justice Bhagwati. You know, the most infamous judgment was given by three topmost judges of the country. And the one judge who was not known to be, um, Justice A. N. Ray was not known to be great anyway, so we can forget him. <laughs> the one judge who was not considered to be great legal luminary, he dissented. Justice Khanna. I almost wish there was a statue of Justice Khanna. He had spine, which is needed. I'm afraid that is what is missing. Junior Chandrachud is very smart, writes wonderful English. I wish they had spine as well. Hello. Uh, sorry, you said about CAA. I should not prejudge that. They've just, uh, they've just heard the first thing and it's being passed on. It will come up again. I'm at the moment disappointed. I'm disappointed because I really thought uh, if a piece of law is so utterly, utterly un unconstitutional as this one is, um, you know, I mean, I started reading a bit of law. I had a wonderful civics teacher in class 10, and that person brought me to doing political science. And honestly, if you had asked me after class 10 and had shown me this piece of law, I would have said, my God, this is absolutely against Indian constitution. If, if something was this was shown to all of you, does this pass test? I'm sure 90% of you would say, my God, on the face of it. To my mind, this is one of those open and shut cases. To my mind, if the Supreme Court had simply said this much, okay, this looks like prima facie, this looks like against the Constitution. Stay its operation. We'll hear you all. We'll hear you out. We'll hear every argument in its favor. But for the time being, because NPR is coming, everything else is coming, stay its operation. The Supreme Court may have enhanced its own stature. So right now, really to my mind, the question is not about, uh, I mean, the entire case in CAA in the Supreme Court, to my mind is not so much about CAA. It's about whether Supreme Court can salvage some of its sinking reputation. Good evening, sir. This is Adit Singh. I'm currently in my first year. So initially I'll put some facts and then I'll come to my original question. Sir, you used a term that the heart is broken from the minority. So I want to say to you that for Muslims, the quota of the Muslim government is to increase the quota of the Muslim government. 
मुसलमानों के लिए जो माइनॉरिटी में उनको इनकम मिलती है स्कॉलरशिप वो बढ़ाने की बात हो या माइनॉरिटी के लिए हुनर हार्ट्स और और भी एक लिस्ट ऑफ प्रोग्राम है वो करने की बात हो ये सब मोदी गवर्नमेंट ने अपने फर्स्ट इसमें किया था कार्यकाल में तो ऐसा कहना कि अचानक से उनका दिल पसीदा ये गलत है सर और कमिंग टू माई एक्चुअल क्वेश्चन यू यूज द टर्म टू एड रिलीजियस प्रोसिक्यूशन इन दी लॉ ऑफ सी ए सपोज आई एम आई एम लाइक माइग्रेटेड फ्रॉम पाकिस्तान एंड नाउ एज पर लॉ आई टू प्रूव दैट आई एम अ हिंदू एंड आई केम बिफोर दिस कट ऑफ डेट सो इफ सपोज दे एड द टर्म रिलीजियस प्रोसिक्यूशन सो हाई हाउ विल आई प्रूव दैट आई एम रिलीजियसली प्रोसिक्यूटेड इन दिस केस आई नीड टू गेट अ सर्टिफिकेट फ्रॉम पाकिस्तान government that they have religiously persecuted me so i actually don't understand this concept sir please tell me how adding the word religious persecution will improve the facts sir uh i'm sure once you uh, go beyond first year and you understand other kinds of <laughs> you need to, no, sorry i don't mean to be condescending i just want to say that there are similar laws all over the world india is not the only country and laws about persecution are there in many countries of the world persecution does not mean you bring a certificate from the home country to say we are persecuting that person so what ha- what happens is that these are group cases categories uh, there is a special term in law class suits so you say okay hindus of pakistan would now be classified as a category of persons who are persecuted so then any hindu can go you don't need to write that in law but it can be decided ahmadiyas from pakistan so as a category there is a class suit they are decided so persecution is a term which is very well understood in law it is not a loose term you don't have to personally prove i was personally persecuted you have to prove that you belong to a group which has been persecuted so that could easily be done uh, we could do that so there is a lot of parallels all over the world eu has very good laws canada has very good laws we could pick from that if we really want to do that on minorities do you want to look into my eyes and say bjp is pro minorities pro muslims <laughs> i'm just be straight on this you know to say i mean mr rajpakshe is pro tamil is he pro tamil will we not get any scheme where some tamils were given 1500 rupees in sri lanka is mr rajpakshe not the enemy of tamils of sri lanka are these not regimes which are outright minor majoritarian regimes so do you really want i mean you know we can come up with one thing is to you know one thing is to pick a fact and throw at something the second is uh, you know one is to be a lawyer the other is to be a judge I want you to be a judge for one moment. Look into my eyes and say BJP is pro minorities. I will take your judgment. आगे चलिए. Good evening, sir. So, uh, my question is that in 20, this uh, 2019 amendment is related to 2014 when the first notification was released. Since then, the so, uh, requirement for citizenship some of them were relaxed. so looking at that some of the people stayed back in india so how should the government cater to the legitimate expectation of these people who stayed back thinking that there would be a law which would give them citizenship secondly coming to the point that you mentioned that there is the supreme court could have declared time of this stay on it but as we have studied that there is always a presumption and validity of the law so keeping that in mind what alternative like one of the reasons why india is not a party to any of the refugee is because we are a secular country so what according to you is a reasonable classification and how should we cater to the problem of illegal immigration uh the point about 2014 is simply to remove that clause if we have a reasonable policy whatever the reasonable policy whatever the criteria don't specify any year if i have a good policy and if someone wants to come tomorrow why not extend the benefits to that person as well you know whatever the law if we agree on everything else if all other four things are met just do away with a 
uh, with a time period requirement. You can have policy on refugees, policy on immigration, which have no cutoff date at all. There is no need for any cutoff date. If the criteria is reasonable, then you can say to those who came in the past and those who come in the future, we extend the same to everyone. Why not? So that's one. What should be the reasonable classification? To my mind, uh, not signing a refugee treaty has nothing to do with being secular. No. A secular country can have refugees. Why not? The problem is if we have refugees based on religious classification, that would be against secular country. But a large number of secular countries have a refugee policy. Uh, what should be the criteria? As I said, simply give a legal wording to what Swami Vivekananda said. That would be a beautiful law and I would support it, which is any persecuted social group from any part of the world should be given fast track and exemption, provided the persecution as a group. It cannot be an individual persecution. It always is a group persecution. Persecution as a group can be established and provided the burden is shared by the entire country. That's a reasonable principle. I think I would, I would welcome and salute such a law and I would personally think India would move one step forward if we were to amend our citizenship act on that light. In the absence of that, I would say, all right, let us live with the existing law. That's at least better than this, that this amendment that has been introduced. That would be my case. So, I'd be saying, please, can I have a question? Very good. I just disagree with you. So, basically, you said that we can't have a date or something like that, right? Can't have it? Date properly. Date based classification is not permissible, that's what you said. But I think the parliament has all such discretion to make a date specifically. On the basis of date, you can classify. Point number one. Point number two, it's a totally a matter of discretion of the parliament. And point number three, as you stated clearly, that we can't have a single class or something like that. So it was very clear from the Chiranjit Lal Chaudhary case that one person on one class, one particularly, can be a classification. Like, one person can be the class for the purpose of classification. So, I think it's a matter of judiciary to first of all point out how the reasonable classification can be a category. They can be a category which has the population of one. So, I can have a category. Let us say uh, those who are religious minority and gender minority and ethnic minority, etc. That category may have the population of one. But that's a reasonable classification. So you are right, I agree that uh, sometimes there can be a category of one person as well. One person is not a category. Category can have only one person who resides in that at the moment. Uh, on the second question, to say parliament has a discretion, of course parliament has a discretion to make any silly law. But that silly law is a silly law. It's an unconstitutional law. So parliament has a discretion to specify date. Yes, but there has to be a principle. There has to be a rational. You cannot say Mr. Modi's birthday shall be the classification. No. There has to be justification for that. So tell me, on what ground is December 2014 a reasonable classification? If you were the judge of Supreme Court, I hope you will become one, you would turn and ask this question. Tell me what happened on 31st December 2014 or around 2014 that you want to draw a line. If your policy is good, why not extend it beyond 2014? That's a question you would ask. So someone has to answer it. It's a valid question. It cannot be, we have discretion, we have decided 31st December 2014. No, sir, that's not all. Every discretion has to be exercised with reason. That, I thought, is an elementary principle of law. It cannot be arbitrary. Discretion is not arbitrary. Yeah, that's it's an arbitrary thing. Someone has to give me a reason to say 31st December 2014 is a good cutoff date. For what reason? Very good evening, sir. Sir, I would like to draw your attention to, towards your questions only, the basis which you were trying to give. Like, uh, you were saying that uh, you should prove whether you are persecuted or not, or was the need to come to India only. 
let's just assume I'm being the person in authority or being the officer and you are the per persecuted person. So I'm asking whether you are persecuted. How are you going to answer it and convince me? Secondly, what is the need of coming only to India? Why not to go any other country? And then again you have to convince. And don't you think that this is giving some sort of very discretionary power to the officer? And shouldn't there be some basis or the legal principles on which we should give the direction to the officers? Well, yes, if these criteria are met, you have to give them, the, give them their rights or whatever they are legitimately asking. So I think by giving this religious criteria and other things, they are just giving those, those principles to the officers to follow. So what's your opinion on that? Or how you will convince You're absolutely me? right. Uh, anything to do with group persecution, should be grounded in some principles. The officer concerned cannot decide, ah, you don't look persecuted to me, or you look persecuted. You know? So they have to be principles. So if I am a Tamil coming from Sri Lanka to India, I can say, and as remember, it's not an individual case being decided, it's a category. I would say, in my country, I have been persecuted for the last 25 years. There was almost a civil war waged against us. Thousands of us were killed. Here is a list. Here is the UN resolution. This is what happened in my country. These are the pieces of law which was enacted against Tamils. So, I am persecuted. Ahmadiyas coming from Pakistan can say, this is what has been done to our people who are Ahmad. We have been denied the following things in Pakistan. This is how our places of uh, worship have been treated. These are the bans and things imposed on us. That's why we are persecuted. So, of course, it has to be grounded on evidence and on principles. You cannot say, you know, I, I get up every morning and feel very persecuted. No, obviously not. So, it has to be based on, A, it has to be a category. B, it has to be based on evidence. And most of these persecutions are very well documented. There are international reports on these things. That Rohingyas in Burma have been persecuted. It's not a fiction, piece of fiction. It's not imagination. There is complete documentation of what has happened to Rohingyas. That is what we should look at. Before we move to the next question, I am requesting many of you all, uh, almost 20 people in queue, uh, to not get offended uh, because uh, we must be having our last uh, student question, which is the next one. And uh, Professor uh, Samuel will then be asking a question and we are on a tight schedule, I'm sorry, because sir has to catch a 9.50 train to Ambikapur. So you'll be cutting from the university in some 20 minutes, 10 minutes. So just... Okay, uh, can I request you to allow two? One is... Right. And second, someone who believes that if I don't answer that person's question, I would be running away from a very tough question. Sir, sir, my question. Anyone who feels persecuted <laughs> can ask second question. Sir. No, but honestly, someone who feels that it's such a difficult question that Mr. Yadav wants to run away from that question. Sir, there is an important that question, one. sir. Take a minute. Ah. It's given us a debate. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Uh, thank you so much for your lovely words that you've said in the starting. Uh, I just want to ask you a question, but before I ask the question, I'd like to just state something so that, you know, you precise here. So, uh, when we have the interviews of politicians, uh, my legal knowledge is not the greatest, so I'll ask a uh, question off the track. Whenever uh, politicians are asked a question, you know, and uh, they resort to an answer which is, you know, you can't question the wisdom of the people of the country. For me, they are playing a political card by which they want to, you know, keep the people happy. But, to my understanding, people of the country, it's, it's not like we cannot question the wisdom of the people, you know. The machinery of the state is such that they are making us believe that whatever they say is true. There are, there are crores of rupees that are being spent on the machinery. So, for example, in the... In the so, just the question that, that I want to ask. We have had certain state elections that, that have happened in the past six months. So, for example, there, there was a state election in Maharashtra, there was a state election in uh, Jharkhand. So, as of now, the people of this country have, you know, resisted this thought of the government that they can divide the people on religious lines. But, for example, as Delhi's result is about to come, the 
the campaign has been very polarizing as you know. So if it becomes a normal in the Delhi results, how do we tackle such a situation because then the state has a free license to you know, communalize every other election. So how, how do we fight such an ideology because sir, there is, there is, there is gunpowder in the air of sorts of... Yeah, uh, I got your question. Uh, one, it is right to say we cannot question people's wisdom and it is wrong to say we cannot question people's wisdom. We cannot question people's wisdom on how much money should be allocated <laughs> where, if they want free electricity and not good transport, that is people's wisdom. We cannot question that. If they want, uh, uh, if they want some allocation for certain schemes and not health and education, it's their wisdom. But we must question people's wisdom on whether they want to throw their neighbor outside the country. Constitution is all about questioning people's wisdom. Constitution is all about deciding the limits to what a majority can do. Otherwise, why do you need a constitution? You can simply say whoever gets prime minister, becomes prime minister, can do what he likes. You don't need a constitution. Constitution exists precisely in order to limit majorities. And a democracy is a democracy only in so far as everyone has a chance to be in mind a majority. A, please remember that I may be in minority today, I can become majority tomorrow because it's a majority or minority of opinions, of political positions. If for some reason I become a permanent minority in democracy, which is to say, I can say, Mera to janami galat hai. I can never be part of majority in this democracy. What stakes do I have in this democracy then? Democracy, constitutional democracies are about ensuring that no one is a permanent minority and that majorities cannot take a certain kind of decisions. Otherwise, you don't need constitutions. So I completely agree there. We, this is just, just nonsense to say you cannot question people's wisdom. Of course, you should question people's wisdom because questioning people's wisdom is to prevent people, is, is to protect people who would come thereafter. Sometimes I have to question your wisdom in order to protect your grandchildren. You may not think of your grandchildren right now, but they will come. I have to protect them against you. This is part of it. Uh, second, in Delhi, absolutely. I think what has happened in the last 10 days, I mean, every time I, remember, I somehow think it cannot get worse than this, and then it gets worse than that. What we have witnessed in the past 10 days in Delhi election is pets. If this is what happens in democracy, ministers inciting violence, inciting, inciting basically it's, it's not just divisive, divisive is a very mild word for what happened in Delhi election in the last 10 days. It is open inciting hatred, incitement of violence, uh, stigmatizing a community. And if this wins, which is highly unlikely, but if that strategy were to succeed, then it's the end of our democracy, whatever remains of our democracy. Because then every government knows it, every opposition knows. You don't have to do anything. So that to me is every citizen of this country must dread it. Uh, I think they are unlikely to succeed. Uh, my own position vis-a-vis -vis Ahmadmi Party is very well known, so I cannot be accused of a bias in favor of Ahmadmi Party. But I sincerely want, hope, and will that BJP gets defeated in deep, in death. <laughs> Just for the sake of democracy. What kind of democracy we have in this country after all? Danga karwao election jito, goli maro salon ko. This is the language being used. Kaise ho sakta? Certain things, I mean, uh, certain things should bring out strong emotions in us. This is one of those things. The last, most dreadful question, yeah. No, 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 you have to decide who has the most dreadful question. I would like you to... So Lord, my friend believes this one. Okay, so by Lord. But it has to be really a difficult question. That you think I may be running away from. Otherwise, please don't ask it. I leave it to your discretion. The question that you think I might wish to run away with. Sir, I think this answer may be questioning your mind. 
सर आई थिंक कि पिछले दो महीने से आप भी और और भी सोशल एक्टिविस्ट हैं जो लोग इस लॉ के अगेंस्ट एक्सटेट कर रहे हैं और मेरे भी माइंड में सर पहले दिन से क्वेश्चन है लाइक यू सेट कि यू हैव अ वेरी लेस फेट इन जुडिशरी और लाइक एज यू सेट कि जुडिशरी इस तरीके से फंक्शन कर रहा है सो वी हैव अ स्लाइट चांस वॉट एवर एपन सर आई जस्ट वॉन्ट टू आस्क यू कि सर एजिट हम लोग इस लॉ के अगेंस्ट एक्सटेट कर रहे हैं यू आर डूइंग योर जॉब a lot of uh, a lot of activists are doing their job sir what if uh, that this law is being justified by the supreme court once it is been passed by the supreme court then what would be the your next step after this like if if it been approved by the supreme court then what next are you like this it could be a question in your mind also i think he uh, where is the bomb the shell i was waiting for it are you also no it's very simple uh you do remember what happened in again let me come back to adm jabalpur supreme court of this country said people do not have right to life what did we do after that we said sorry you have gone against the constitution this is what we did this is what we celebrate this is what mr narendra modi celebrates when he says in against emergency we struggled so mr narendra modi celebrates the fact that people of india rejected supreme court's verdict because that verdict was one of the most shameful verdict in the history of the country please remember republic in the last instance you see republic is founded on some principles there are some institutions which are meant to defend the republic judiciary other autonomous institutions and everything but if they fail what do we do please remember put it in your heart put it in your mind put it on your book in the last instance republic must be defended by the public it is republic the people of india have given themselves this constitution in the last instance they must defend it please ask yourself how did pakistan come out of the ulama's dictatorship how did bangladesh come out of irshad's dictatorship how did nepal come out of king's rule we don't think much of pakistan bangladesh and nepal we think of them as tiny ones but you know what ye hum hindustaniyon ko democracy free fund mein mil gayi we don't value democracy people in nepal bangladesh and pakistan they fought for democracy they understand the value of democracy because they fought for it that is why hum dekhenge comes from pakistan doesn't come from india you know because they fought ye to hamare desh mein illiteracy ka raj hai otherwise a woman wearing a black sari sari which was prohibited at that time a woman wearing a black sari and singing hum dekhenge to thousands of people this is what in the last instance defends democracy so i sincerely hope that institutions which are meant to protect the republic do protect it at the moment every day my hopes are sinking in the last instance people shall have to defend this republic and i think we may come to that point sooner or later thank you for the question thank you very much sir for your uh, long speech and uh, the reason and rationality with which you substantiate your point of view uh, now i have a question which is hypothetical one uh, because i like the statement that you made that it's not problematic when we say that we are into politics i mean it's problematic when you say that we are uh, non political or we are apolitical i must say that we are going through probably one of the toughest times during the last 73 years of our journey as a democracy we are the largest democracy in the world and the democracy as i understand as a student of political science i think it's not simply understood in terms of rule by majority i think in a democracy there would be some kind of contest competition confrontation but that has to be negotiated that has to be uh, you know the differences would be there that has to be ironed out and we must you know develop policies or make policies to a consensus basis now having said that 
I must say that, you know, uh, emotions are running high, referring to this uh, Citizenship Amendment Act and the protests that are going on on the streets. If you were the Prime Minister or the Home Minister ruling the country, then given the problem that has been created because of a law which may be flawed or which might have, you know, created the problem, what would be your approach to resolve the problem? Because I feel it's through politics that we govern the country by bringing in policies and it's through politics that we must resolve any kind of crisis that comes up. So absolutely, thank you. Uh, it's a very reasonable question. Uh, because like you, I have faith in politics. Aastha, the word I use very rarely. Uh, politics, as Aristotle said, is the highest activity human beings are capable of. Politics is equivalent to a decathlon in sports. Or maybe you like that metaphor more. You have directors of cinema. You see, you have people who know script writing, those who know acting, those who know cinematography. But then there's a director who needs to know everything. <laughs> politics is that. <coughs> so yes, politics, I often say, is the yoga dharma. Politics is the most happening place. Uh, that's why all the scoundrels will come to politics. That is why all the saints and scholars should come to politics too. Uh, having said that, to your specific question, let us imagine I'm Home Minister, Prime Minister of this country. Therefore, I obviously believe that CA is a very good law. Let us imagine I believe that CA is a very good law. It is in the interest of the country. And I see thousands of people protesting about that on street. I see these women sitting at night with their children, not paid 500 rupees, but coming on their own. I see lakhs of people, of, primarily of one minority or of one region in the Northeast, coming out on streets to protest. I continue to believe that it's a good law. What would I do? That's a question. I would say, number one, I would go to them. Remember, you launch silliest of small protests in Raipur about Bijli or something. You sit for five days, some silly bureaucrat or some silly minister will come to you. Why? Kya baat hai? Kya problem? What's your problem? Number one, I will go and speak. Number two, I would say, all right, you are wrong. You are mistaken, you've been fed lies, but you are scared. You are scared. If you go and travel to the country, I've been to so many states, in the eyes of minorities, specifically Muslims, because this act is targeted at Muslims, you can see fear in their eyes. If I was prime minister, I would say, even if the fear is wrong, I recognize your fear to be fear. You say, I understand your fear. My friend, you are wrong. Should that not be a minimum democratic protocol to say, okay, NPR won't happen in April 2020. There is no reason on earth why NPR should take place on the first. If it could take place in 2015, which was not a census year, why can't it happen in 2023? I would say, okay, don't worry. NPR nahi karenge, daro mat ya, tum mere desh ke log. Above all, I would say to these people in Shaheen Bagh, everywhere else, I would say, you are my citizen. Tum mere log. Democracy begins with this. I will take their hands and say, there are a lot of differences from me. Someone has come to Yogen Jadav, like people have come to your eyes, and they have come to your eyes. But don't worry, I am with you. I am your Prime Minister. You have not given me a vote, but I am your Prime Minister. Don't worry. I have stopped for a year. This is how democracy takes place. Thank you. 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 I would first refer CEA to the Supreme Court. I will wait for the Supreme Court's verdict before I notify it. So 
elementary things of democracy where you agree, where I continue to believe that CA is right, even then I would. This is how democracy progresses. What is being done is so anti-democratic. Even if Mr. Modi is correct about CA being a wonderful law, is this how you treat your people? He mocks at protesters. Kya kehte hai? Aisa dabao ki shahin baat tak current pahunche. Is this the language that rulers should speak? Basically, the message the government is giving to protesters for the last two months is, tum mere log nahi ho, kar lo. Foreigners ho, jo marji kar lo is desh ke andar, tumhara kaun pusne wala hai. That, to me, is the worst part of what is happening. At least, itna to kaho ki tum mere log ho. Ye nahi ho raha hai. This is what I would do if I was the Prime Minister. Thank you. And finally, can I do allow me a bit of uh, uh, information? One, in case you want to get in touch with me, my email is whatever you guess to be my email, which is yogendra.yadav at gmail.com. I do read it, not within hours, I read it. Please feel free to write to me. And those of you who may wish to contribute to this campaign to defend the country. Uh, here is my friend. Uh, please give your name and number. Uh, can you please give your name and number if you want to join? In some way support this, this defense of the republic, which is what we are into. I'm not saying come out and do Zindabad, Murdabad. There are thousands of ways in which we can defend this republic. Small ways. Do give your number to him. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we're really short on time. So I'd like to thank sir for taking time out, for his patience. And to all of us here for coming here and making sure that this university really is a marketplace of ideas where we can talk about issues, where we can disagree with each, with each other with enthusiasm. And foremost to sir for his patience in addressing us, his patience in taking our questions. And for being very, very nice throughout to us. And it has been a wonderful experience hosting you. And if I continue <coughs> any further, then sir will either have to skip dinner or people in Ambikapur are going to be really mad at us tomorrow. <laughs> so we are going to cut it short and um, we request sir to move to the boardroom for the notice. Thank you.